Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, try to put together what we know uh, and give you a sense of where this investigation might be headed and also give you a sense of some places where, um, which might ultimately turn out to be dead ends. But we'll tell you what we do know is this. On the launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia, something happened which caught all of our attention who watch uh, Space Shuttle launches. If you look at this very closely, what you will see here is a piece of the foam, the orange foam on that external tank, fell off at high velocity into the leading edge of the left wing. NASA saw this, engineers were looking at this throughout the entirety of the six-day mission, determined after some very careful analysis that number one, they didn't think it caused any truly significant damage, and number two, even if it did, they had zero options to deal with it. Uh, and so the decision was made to let it be. That was the left wing. The left wing is significant in this because we do know that the failure appeared to begin on the left wing based on the telemetry we've heard from uh, Houston and from NASA. Now the tiles are a key thing here. There are some 20,000 of these tiles which coat a space shuttle. And you can see the little bricks here. Each of them is absolutely individual, like a little snowflake, if you will, numbered and watched over carefully. We witnessed the landing of uh, Discovery a couple years ago, and I don't know if you can see up here, there was a missing tile on the trailing edge of the flap called the Elevon. Uh, that got a lot of people's attention. One tile missing in a place that was not deemed critical, but it turned out to be a big, fairly serious investigation. There you see that missing tile there. Why are the tiles important? Well, here's what happens uh, when a shuttle comes back from uh, orbit. It circles the globe at 17,500 miles an hour. It's the perfect uh, equation between uh, speed and a free fall and causes it just to free fall around the Earth. It slows down just enough to begin its fall to Earth, and as it comes into the atmosphere, it gets into thicker and thicker air. It heats up very quickly. The shuttle's frame is made of aluminum. Aluminum would melt uh, it well below the 3,000 degrees which a space shuttle encounters on that reentry, and so the space shuttle orbiters are covered with uh, three levels of thermal protection, blankets and tiles primarily, the black tiles being the ones which are in the position to receive the most heat. As it comes in, the nose goes high, and it begins these uh, steep banking maneuvers called roll reversals. All this is uh, about trading speed for heat, slowing it down and uh, getting it just hot enough to withstand uh, and at the levels that it can withstand. The failure that we witnessed was just as the space shuttle was at its red hottest, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Those tiles are designed to handle that, but if a, some of those tiles, a cluster of those tiles, were to fall off, uh, it would, uh, the shuttle would be unprotected from that tremendous heat. Now take a look at this picture and you'll see exactly what was captured as the shuttle Columbia streaked across the skies of Texas, 100 miles south of Dallas uh, this morning. Uh, what started off as a single meteor-like streak, which is perfectly normal, quickly turned into something much more ominous as multiple streaks uh, happened as it uh, broke up in mid-flight. 200,000 feet in altitude, Mach 18, much faster than a rifle bullet. We're talking about tremendous velocity. This is the utter apex of the heat and stresses during this re-entry. So if there had been any sort of weakness that occurred in that tile system, whether it happened on launch or happened for some other reason, this is when it would become exposed and obvious, and this is exactly what we're seeing here. Now, there is some um, concern tonight that the engineers who are poring over this data are looking at some unusual movements of those body flaps I was telling you about, those elevons. What that has to do with this, very early uh, at this juncture to draw any sort of conclusions. Now, the debris field is literally a multi-stage debris field. There's never been a breakup like this in the history of aviation. Something at this altitude, traveling this fast, breaking up into pieces. And if you look on the left-hand side, you're looking at debris which was recovered from Challenger 17 years ago, uh, the anniversary occurring just this past week. To the right, you see some of the small pieces which have been strewn across Arizona. New Mexico, Texas, and parts of Louisiana. Uh, the question uh, that I have been posing to engineers is, is, is the pieces are so small, it's spread over such a large area, could there be a smoking gun which will go unnoticed? 
which is the harder uh, debris field to handle, 100 feet below the surface of the ocean or 100 miles across the state of Texas. Hard to say, but the fact of the matter is we want to tell you that if you see a piece of the space shuttle, number one, don't touch it for the benefit of your own health. There's a toxic brew on board those space shuttles, monomethyl hydrazine, nitrogen tetroxide, nasty stuff can cause you all kinds of harm, and certainly you would not want to grab a souvenir that might be the so solution to this uh, terrible and tragic riddle. Earlier, Wolf Blitzer reported from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. That's home of mission control and the pre-flight preparation. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Johnson Space Center, the, sort of the heart and soul, the manned space program. This is where the astronauts uh, live and train, and uh, this is where the simulators are for the uh, space shuttle. Uh, the testing that's done at Johnson Space Center often sets the standard uh, for uh, future space travels and is uh, the place where astronauts live and work. Now, working in conjunction with Houston is the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It is responsible for the checkout, the launch and landing, of course, of space shuttles and their payloads. It's also where equipment designed for the International Space Station gets its final checkout and uh, its preparations before it is loaded on board the shuttle. Today, it is where the families of the astronauts had gathered at that shuttle landing facility, that 15,000-foot runway at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, where the shuttle returns. Uh, the alternate landing site, as you uh, might well recall, is Edwards Air Force Base uh, in California. And uh, let's uh, move on. Let's move, uh, let's send our attention now to the Kennedy Space Center, where we find CNN's Lou Dobbs. Lou? Miles, thank you. As you point out, uh, ST-107 began its journey uh, uh, 16 days ago, launching from uh, Pad A here at the Kennedy Space Center. The, the men and women of NASA here today, first shocked and grief, uh, trying to come to terms with this tragedy trying to begin the process here as in every NASA center across the country of trying to understand what had caused the loss of life, the loss of the Columbia. But the first thing that the men and women of NASA today wanted to do was to remember, to honor, and to pay tribute to the seven crew members lost this morning on the Columbia. And NASA observed a minute of silence. Well, I'm feeling pretty bad about this accident. I mean, like, ever since Challenger crashed, I thought there was never going to be another space shuttle accident. Now I'm here today at the memorial. I'm ashamed of the seven astronauts that were killed at this time today. That's all I have to say. Just pure shock disbelief this is unreal I mean you're you come out here expecting to see a shuttle land and it's just not there it's just not there it's just completely floors you it's uh, sort of heart rendering the cause of the loss of these people and uh, it's hard to even conceive you know that we've lost additional people John Zarella has been here with me throughout the uh, much of this tragic day and John uh, uh, these fallen astronauts uh, who we honor and remember tonight uh, uh, not alone as, as, as tragic victims of the of the failures amidst all of the glorious successes of the US space program all right that's right uh, Lou and in fact as you're well aware not too far from here at the visitors center there is a memorial to the astronauts a granite slab uh, over there and there are lots of people here today because they expected to see a landing. Always busy on weekends, more so today. They did not see that landing, and when word filtered down and finally came out that, in fact, uh, there had been a terrible tragedy uh, over Texas, uh, many people began to go to that granite memorial. It is a wall, and inscribed on that wall the names of 17 astronauts who have perished. The, of course, the Challenger 7, the Apollo 1 fire victims, the three astronauts there, and then another seven astronauts who perished in other other means who had not made it to flight. So 17 astronauts in all, people went to pay their tributes there. What they did there was to lay flowers. Some of them prayed. Some of them just observed a moment of silence as the NASA workers themselves did as well. 
Uh, and we can certainly expect that, uh, as we saw out at the Johnson Space Center, that the memorials, the ad lib memorials that people are bringing will probably grow and grow uh, as the days go by here at the, uh, the Kennedy Space Center as people come to pay tribute, tragically, once again, to seven more fallen heroes. Lou? To pay tribute and to, uh, to come to terms with grief. John, thank you very much. John Zarella. Now back to you, Miles O'Brien. Thank you very much, Lou. One of the astronauts who's flown on Columbia, as a matter of fact, one of the most seasoned astronauts ever, NASA's Story Musgrave will be with us shortly. I'll talk about uh, Columbia with him and the risks and rewards of space flight after we take a brief break. Stay with us.